Appreciate that. As I said a moment ago, we're going to pull off of our study, end time prophecy and end time related events. And I want to preach a couple messages leading up to Easter. <clears throat> John chapter number three in your Bibles. John chapter number three. And if you're able, let's all stand to the reading of God's word. And if you're not able to stand, just remain seated. Also at this time, all of our boys and girls that are in junior church, if you'd like to dismiss toward the back, <clears throat> that'll be there for you. John chapter number three, this is very early in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he, is, he has done his first miracle and he is now starting to minister 
and he has a private conversation with this man by the name of Nicodemus. And we're going to pick up in this conversation at verse number 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but of everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I'd like for us to read verse number 17 together in unison, and we will start now. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I thought I would take a moment this morning and next week pre-Easter and talk about why we celebrate Easter. Is is this about bunny rabbits and and colored eggs? Or, uh, I mean, is this uh, about a meal that we all do together in celebration of something that took place 2,000 years ago. What is the purpose of Easter, biblically? And let's talk about this today. Father, thank you for the hour we have now set before us. We do pray that your Holy Spirit will work and guide and direct and bring those who need to be brought to Christ to such a place this morning. Thank you for your goodness. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, in just a couple of weeks, it's kind of for me, Easter that is, it's like kind of like Christmas. I mean, in Christmas time, we are celebrating the birth of the Son of God. And we prepare for that, don't we? I mean, people will actually, they'll prepare months out in advance. Decorations, buying of this, buying of that, thinking of things of what to give this one and this one and such. Well, Easter really ought to be the same way because being that Christ was born, virgin born, and no doubt there's a great celebration there, if Christ had not risen from the grave, it would not matter how he was born. And if Christ be dead today, and if Christ is not resurrected, then we're all sitting here for nothing this morning. And this means nothing. Because the Bible says he was raised again for our justifications. And he is risen today. And we serve a risen Savior. So Easter, it's an observant for us concerning the bodily resurrection of God's Son, Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for your sin. He was buried in a grave. And on the third day, friend, he did resurrect. And he did rise, and he is alive today. Now, the significance of such is because he is risen, Jesus alone has power over your life's greatest enemy. And that is Mr. Death. Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave. And because he conquered death, hell, and the grave, He is the Savior, or He has the ability to give salvation, deliverance from death unto such that call upon Him. We think about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and why He came and what this was all about and and why we're here this morning. Well, give me your ear, and I want to just kind of lay out the story real quick, a three-year thought of the life in the ministering of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in the Bible it says this, for as in Adam, all die. Now Adam would be, no doubt, the very first man that God created. And God created Adam perfect, body, soul, and spirit. And God gave Adam one simple but yet profound command. Everything in the garden thou mayest freely eat of except the knowledge, the tree, the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God told Adam, the very first man created, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And we know that Adam disobeyed God and he ate off of that tree. 
And when he ate off of that tree, a judgment came upon mankind. And it's called D-E-A-T-H. We die because Adam did what he did. In the beginning, Adam was an eternal created being. He would have lived forever. But because he chose to disobey God, there was a punishment that came into the life of Adam. And that is, as the scripture says, for as in Adam, all die. I've inherited something from my father that my father inherited from his father, that my grandfather inherited from his father, that my great-great-grandfather inherited from his father, which goes all the way back to Adam. And my gene pool today is the sickness and the disease of sin that has slowly taken my life away. I can do nothing about this in the sense of from a physical standpoint. It's appointed unto men once to die. Then after this, the judgment. No one can escape death. And the fact of the matter is, as Scripture teaches, as in Adam, all die. Now, if we stopped there and we left it there, we would be of most miserable people because we say, where is our hope at? But the Scripture doesn't end there. It says in verse 22, for as in Adam, all die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. So in Adam, yes, we can expect death. But in the person of Jesus Christ, we can expect life. And with this in mind, when Paul was writing to the church at Rome, he said, and I quote, Wherefore, as by the truth of the matter, wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. It entered into the human gene pool. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered entered the world and death by sin and so death has passed upon all men for all men have sinned well with that in mind then Christ has got a purpose he's got a purpose when he came to earth he had a purpose to help us in a situation that you and I cannot help ourselves in and if you'll recall the words of the Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry he is saying what we just wrote in our text, or read in our text, that God had sent him out of his love. But in the gospel of, and that's correct, but in the gospel of Mark, chapter number 10, Jesus said, and I quote, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus Christ came to give his life a ransom on our behalf so that we can have life. Now, we know he spent his three years doing what? Well, he spent his three years on earth doing that in which only God could do. You've never met nobody who can walk on water. No, you have not. You've never met nobody who can raise a dead man. No, you've not. You've never met a man who can touch a guy and give him his sight back. You've never met a man who can touch a man and give him his hearing back. You've never met a person who can touch a woman and take her issue of blood away. You've never met a man who can take water and turn it into wine. We've never met a man who died and we went to his funeral and wept and watched him on the cross and three days later sat down and eat and drink with him and talk with him. We've never met such like that. But this is the one in whom we are talking about this morning. This is the son of the living God. And throughout his ministry, he proved one undisputable fact. And that is this. No man can do what thou doest except God be with him. Jesus Christ proved over and over and over he was beyond a man, but yet he was a man. But he was more than a man. He is the Son of God. He is the written Word. He is the one who has made you, created you, and He is the one in whom one day you will stand before. For all things live unto Him and die unto Him. And He is before all things and by Him all things consist. This is the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, as his ministry starts to unfold towards the end of it, he got down to what we would call the seriousness of his business. That is the life 
life-changing work of salvation. And in the Gospel of John, we find as we fast forward, and I'm talking this morning about why we celebrate Easter and why this is so important to us and why we ought to uh, praise God for His goodness of uh, providing what He has provided in the person of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, He's before Pilate, you see. He's before Pilate. And the Jews had delivered Him up out of spite and vengeance and so much the more. And as He stood before Pilate, Pilate didn't quite know what to do with this man. And his wife came over to him and says, you be careful with this man. I've had some dreams about this man. You be careful what you do with him. And he was uncertain exactly what to do, but he asked the people. And you know what they said? Same thing they say today. He said, will you have me the release unto you, Jesus, your king? Ah, the people said, we have no king but Caesar. And the thing that's happened to the United States of America today and what's happening in our cultures today and what's happening in our world today is that we've got men and women who are refusing Jesus as their king over themselves. And ladies and gentlemen, it's not your kingdom. You have no kingdom. We're here, as the Bible says, as a wind that bloweth by and returneth not again. But so many today will settle for second best, they say. I want my kingdom. This is my kingdom. He will not be over it. This is my kingdom. I'll not allow him over it. And so many today will not allow Jesus Christ in their life to have a preeminent position in their life because of their own little kingdom. We'll not have this man to rule over us. I can tell you from experience, it's a good thing when he rules over you. He'll keep your life together, friend. He'll keep you in the path that you know not of. And he said, what shall I do then with your king? And they said, crucify him. Crucify him. And the plan of God starts to unfold. And he says, do you hear what they say? Do you not know the power that I have? Jesus said, you have no power over me. You have no power over me. I have power to lay my life down and I have power to take it up again. My kingdom is not of this world. And the fact of the matter is, as we think of this story, they delivered him therefore to be crucified. And they took Jesus and they led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. And there they crucified him with two other with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read, Many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified, was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. And that is so all of the known world in that day would know just who he was. Well, the high priest went back and he says, Take that off of him. Don't say that he's the king of the Jews. Put on there, he said he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. And there he hung with a sign over him. Jesus, king of the Jews. And they mocked him. And they laughed at him. And they scourged him. And they spit up towards him. While his ribs and his back was showing and exposed. And he was a bleedy, bleeding, bloody mess. And as he hung there on the cross, he looked down at his mother, and his mother was broken. And he looked at his disciple and he said, take up my mother. And Mary, from that day forward, was adopted into the house of John, and John took care of his mother. And after he had seen that all things were accomplished, he simply said, I thirst. And they took some hyssop and vinegar and they put it to his mouth. And the Bible says, he said his last words, it is finished. And when he said such, his head collapsed. And the Bible says he gave up the ghost. And there he is. The death. Can I say the substitutionary death? As the lady sang, you know who he was dying for? He was dying for me. He was dying for my transgression. 
He was dying for my sin. He was dying for all my fault and wrong and my wickedness. Well, if we move on in the chapter, they come to the men and they want to go ahead and finish them up and the two thieves are still alive. So they go to them and they snap their legs so they couldn't push up and get air. And now their legs are snapped and they came to Jesus and he's dead. And they put a spear up there just to make sure and blood and water came forth. Fulfilling the scripture, not a bone of his body was broken. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the cross, that is, identifying with Christ, uh, fear of the Jews, besought Pilate. He went to him, he said, can I have his body? Can you what? Can I have his body? And then there also came Nicodemus, which at first, who we read in our text, who Jesus was speaking to, came to Jesus by night, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and alloys and a hundred pound of weight. And they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen cloths with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new scepter wherein was never man laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation. So we see him dying. He died because they buried him, didn't they? We see his burial. And then we move on three days. We move into chapter number 20. And on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, today, the first day of the week, three days later, cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the scepter, and seeth the stone taken away from the scepter. She looks down, the stone's been moved. Then she runneth back, and cometh to Simon Peter and the other disciples whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They've taken away the Lord out of the scepter. We know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple, and they came to the scepter. And they ran together and they came in and stooping down, looking in, they saw just linen clothes lying, yet he was not in it. He was gone. Amen. So they left. That is Peter and John, perplexed. What is this about? And the Bible says, but Mary didn't go with them. She was so heartbroken. She's standing over on the side of the tomb and she's just weeping. And she's weeping. You know, the Lord had done a lot for her. He had saved her from hell. He had changed her from a very wicked, horrible life, and he had given her a good life. She loved him. And now the love of her life is gone. And she's weeping. And she's brokenhearted. And God in his kindness, the Bible says, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the scepter, and she see two angels and white setting, the one on the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said, hey woman, hope you see, this is hope. Why weepest thou? What are you so tore up about? Why weepest thou? She said, because they've taken away my Lord and I know not where they've laid him. And when she had said thus, she turned herself back and she saw Jesus standing. It's early in the morning, it's dewy, it's foggy, it's a little bit darkish, and he's airing a garment. And she knew not that it was Jesus, and she thought perhaps he was the gardener. Jesus asked her, woman, why weepest thou? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, sir, basically at this, if you've came and take his body and you put him somewhere, will you tell me where he's at? I won't tell nobody. I'll go get him, and I'll take care of him. Where have you put him at? And you know what? About that time, he said this, Mary. And she knew it was the Lord. You know when God speaks to you and speaks to your heart, you know who it is, don't you? Amen. You know who it is. And her grief and pain and confusion started to be released from her. 
And she turned and said unto him, Rabbi, that is master's. She's looking. She's looking at a bodily resurrected Savior and whom she had been following for about three years. She looked at him on the cross. She's seen his death. She no doubt had something to do with the falling to the grave. Now she is looking at him and he is alive. The death, the burial, the resurrection. And then there is the witness. The witnesses. Those who seen. As Paul the Apostle had made so clear. He says, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen. Now watch. He was seen of Cephas. Then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at one time. Five hundred people. At one time. Could testify. We seen him. We heard him. Paul says of whom the greater part remaineth unto this present. They're still alive, but some has fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And Paul says, last of all, he was seen of me. Did Paul see him? How did Paul see him? Well, Paul seen him, his life was changed. What did he have? He had a written letter from the high priest that if he found anybody teaching and preaching in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he can martyr them, he can take them back to jail and try them. Here is a man dead set on Christianity who on the road to Damascus is suddenly blinded. It was a peculiar sovereign event in his life and he heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you? Lord, and he says, I am Jesus. And here we read about this man and his encounter with Jesus some 26 years later we're reading about him. Paul looked upon him. His life was totally, totally changed. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, it stands as a means of communication from me to uh, to you as a pastor, but from us, the Word, from the Word to us, as to understand some things about God and what God wanted to be done and what God would uh, want to accomplish. The resurrection stands to us word concerning a few things. And that's first of all, going back to our text in John chapter 3, verse 14, back to our text, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ reminds us and teaches us and shows us this, that the wage of sin is death. The wage of sin is death. Remember, when it came to Christ dying, it was the just for the unjust. The wage of sin is death. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Paul the Apostle, again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 21 says this, For since by man, that's Adam, came death, by man, that's Jesus Christ, came also the resurrection of the dead. Why did Jesus die on the cross? He died as a propitiation. He died as a substitute sacrifice. He died in your place. He represented you being perfect, but yet being guilty so that your guilt could be forgiven and overcome by his perfection by accepting him as your personal Lord and Savior. The Bible makes it extremely clear, clear for the wages of sin is death. Yet, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What's going on here with Moses as he's talking about as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. The nation of Israel had sinned. They had sinned against God. And you know what God did that night? 
he allowed some snakes to come into the camp. And if you go back to the book of Numbers and read it, them snakes were poisonous. And they started biting people. And the next morning they got up and a bunch of them were dead. Thousands and thousands of people are dead. And people are on the brink of dying. And Moses is like, what's going on here? And God says, I'm, I've heard their murmuring. I've heard their gossip. I've heard this. I've heard that. And God tells him, go and take a piece of brass and beat a serpent out of it. And put it on a pole and raise it up high. And you tell the people of Israel, if they'll come and look up, I'll heal them. And every man and every woman that came and did what Moses told them and looked up to that brazen serpent was healed of that snake bite. And what Jesus is saying, if I be lifted up, and he was lifted up, and if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And so the fact of the matter is, when Christ died, it was a substitutionary death. He was dying for the wage of sin, yet he had no sin. He was dying for the wrath of God to be alleviated and pardoned from your life, yet he did nothing wrong. The resurrection shows us that the wage of sin is death, and sin is very, very serious. Secondly, the resurrection shows us, as verse 16 teaches, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The resurrection shows us one thing, that is that God has an incredible love for you. God has an incredible love for you. I was talking with somebody a while back who living a certain type of a lifestyle and he's wore out a lot of family members and he said, no one loves me. No one loves me. I burn on my bridges. I said, sir, Jesus loves you. Amen. Jesus loves you. Do you think that Jesus would love me? I said, I can tell you Jesus loves you. That's why I'm here right now talking with you. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. You know, the Bible says, but God commended. He showed. He expressed. God commended his love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us while I had nothing good to offer him while I had no means of righteousness while I have absolutely no credit to anything good in my life God says I love him enough and I'll look over that and I'll send my son to redeem him from the curse that's upon him from the sin we see God's incredible love for you he sent his only begotten son we also see that the resurrection means that there's hope. There's hope. If Jesus had not resurrected, then we're, we're done here, friend. He is, he is resurrected. Amen. And there's hope today. Well, what's that mean? Well, listen to what it says here. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. There's hope for us today. There's hope for every man and there's hope for every woman and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God didn't send his son to condemn men. He sent his son to save men. Amen. And that means you can have hope today in your life. If something has captivated you or if something is running and ruling and dominating your life and you feel you have no freedom and back to the matter is so many today do not have freedom. They do not live in the joy and the peace of God. They live in the bondage of a dark dungeon. Jesus alone can open up that door and set free. There's hope. There's hope. He can change our circumstances. There's hope. He can make us a new creature. There's hope. There's hope not in this life, but yet in the life to come. There's hope of eternal life in heaven saved God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved God sent Jesus not to condemn you but to save you God didn't send Jesus to bow back you but to lift you up from your battered life God didn't send Jesus to be a, a judge over you although one day he will be but God didn't send Jesus to be a judge over you. God sent Jesus to justify you so that you could live in the abundance of joy. There is hope. There, are, it looks like from an outskirts of politicians and where the world's at today and its world system, I can assure you, friend, there is no hope there. 
There is no hope in this world system. There is no hope in the big house or the local houses. They struggle with the same things you struggle with. They just cover it up a lot easier. They're not as honest as you are about things. They've learned to dunk and to dodge and put on the makeup. The only hope we have today is in Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the only hope this world's ever had. Amen. And he's the only hope this world will ever have. Amen. He came not to condemn. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And then lastly, the resurrection. What does it mean that he rose again? Well, it means that sin is real, friend. It means it's real. It means, as the old preacher said, payday someday. It's a coming. It means the sin must be dealt with. It means and expresses the incredible love that God has for you by sending his son to die for you. And it means hope to you. You're never hopeless apart from Christ. But it also means one other thing. That men are in current condemnation. And Jesus came to fix that. Now I don't know if you want him to fix you here. Because this is a personal choice. But I'm telling you right now where you're at. And what the Bible says about the resurrection and what it shows. And the sense of the ministry of Christ. He says in verse 18, as we conclude, he that believeth on him is not condemned. So you give your life and your heart to Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven you. Your book, your name is written in the book, the Lamb's book of life, and you're given eternal life. And you, 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 you'll figure out the hope thing. You, you'll experience it. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Watch though. But he that believeth not is condemned already. It's not that there's a day coming. The day is now. Right now. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why is he condemned? You, you telling me I'm condemned right now? No, God is telling you you're condemned right now. Well, why am I condemned right now? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There is a current condemnation. Here's what I'm saying. There's a warning. The resurrection warns us. It's a warning, friend. It's a warning. That when we die, life is not over. It's appointed on the men once to die, then after this, the judgment. Everybody in this room will never die. You'll die physically, but you'll live forever in your body, your soul body, who you really, what you really are. Current condition is that apart from Jesus Christ, we are in condemnation. Now, Jesus... <clears throat> As we think about this, and once again, we're concluding in Mark chapter number one, after his baptism. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And here's what he said. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Now, that's the message of the king. That's the message. You say, it's simple. Oh, but it gets in the heart. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Jesus says the time is at hand. If we fast forward to the gospel of Luke with this concluding thought. In chapter 13, here's what Jesus said. Now there were present in verse 1 at that season some that told him, that is Jesus, of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now, we don't know much about this, but it sounds like there was a group of men, um, they were Galileans in nature, and they must have tried to rise up against Jewish or Roman authority, and to who knows what extent, and Pilate, or excuse me, not Pilate, um, yes, Pilate had taken them, and he martyred them, and he had taken their sacrifices and 
put them in it or some, something very evil and wicked had taken place. We don't know the fullness of it. There were present at that season some that had told him of the Galileans, whoever they were, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. It's an awful thing. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things? Here's what they're saying. Did you hear about how evil and how wicked and how horrible them Galileans were? They were so wicked, so evil, so horrible that Pilate, when he martyred them, he martyred them with the own sacrificial blood that they were opposing or bringing or however this thing went down unto God. Maybe it was something like he martyred them and he says, you want to serve your God? Is this bull the blood that's going to cleanse you? And he maybe had a bull put over him and the head took it off of the bull and let that blood run over him. We think something like that happened. But Jesus says, do you think this happened because they were just a great, 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 great sinner? And Jesus says, I tell you nay. That's not why this happened. I tell you nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Now what that did is it put the audience in the same company of the ones in whom the audience was saying were bad, 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 bad people. Jesus saying to them, you're in the same predicament. You're in the same spot. Your self-righteousness isn't going to work here. And he goes on. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. So obviously there was 18 in the Tower of Siloam. They built themselves up in there. They rebelled against the authority. They said, we're not coming out. They said, okay, we'll take care of this. We'll light this thing afire. We'll knock a few blocks off of it. It'll come down on you. And if you want to die like that, die like that. And that's how they die. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? He says, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Here's what Jesus is trying to tell them. There is not a just man that walketh upon the earth. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes, that's an awful thing the way they die, but you will die and go to the same place they are, not because of what they've done, but because of what you haven't done. Now, what does he say in the scripture? He says very clearly in the scripture that there's a warning here about condemnation. Is condemned already. Them men who died in that 18, uh, that them 18 men when they passed away, they were condemned already. They didn't die because of whatever was going on there. They were already like that. Those men that Pilate martyred with their blood and their sacrifices, they weren't sinners just because of that. They were sinners prior to that. And the Bible says if we're not saved, condemnation is not coming. We are under condemnation right now. That's why salvation is such a serious thing. And with that, we'll listen to the words of the prophet Isaiah and we'll conclude. Here's what Isaiah said about salvation and giving your life and your heart to Jesus Christ. I quote, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Oh, I got plenty of time. You have no clue about that. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. current condemnation the bible says for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved the bible says and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire how does our name get in the book of life by placing your life and your faith and trust in the finished work of god's son Jesus Christ. There is no other way. This is what the resurrection teaches us of. It teaches us that the wage of sin is real. Death is coming. It teaches us that there's a great God in heaven and he's not willing that any should perish. He loves you more than you love you. 
It teaches us there's a hope for you. You're not hopeless. There is salvation. Jesus came not to condemn, but to save. But the resurrection also teaches us this. You think he didn't resurrect. You joke around with this. You say, I don't believe it. You'll be condemned for all eternity. He did resurrect, friend. He is alive today. And he is holding all of this together, just like he says. And, when, and, 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 and in our lives, we have a wonderful opportunity to give our person to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you've never been saved, right where you're at, if you believe that Jesus died for your sin, was buried in a grave, and on the third day rose again, why don't you ask him? Do you believe these things? you believe these things this morning? you believe these things the Bible teaches? Is this, is this wrong or is this right? Is this right or wrong, ladies and gentlemen? If you believe it, why don't you embrace it? Let's have our heads bowed. Father, thank you for the opportunity this morning that we have had to come into your very presence with your word. We're asking and praying this morning that the Holy Ghost will search our hearts. We're asking and praying this morning that the Holy Ghost will show us what we need. I don't know exactly the heart of every person here this morning. Lord, you do though. You know. You know all things. And I'm thankful, Lord Jesus, that you're able to look down upon us today from the right hand of the throne of God. And you're able to work and move and motivate our hearts to belief. You're able to quicken us. You're able to save us. We serve a risen Savior. Now, Father, today, I pray that you'll have your perfect will and way in these services. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.